I'm Chris Harries and at the moment I'm a commercial beekeeper. I started doing it full time when I was made redundant from BT uh, about 15 years ago. Okay, and how did you first get into it? I started at school back in 1962. They had a, a club and the school I went to and um, that's how I got into it really. Uh, what, what made you uh, like beekeeping when you were at school? What, what first? I was always in, I was always into um, sort of natural history and things like that, you know, bird watching and all that sort of stuff, you know. And so I just give it a go, you know, see what happens. And uh, yeah, and then when you were working for BT, were you doing it on the side as well then? Or? Oh yeah, it was. It was a. I started because um, I never had any bees after I left school until about. 77, 1977, and I bought two hives and just started it as a hobby, with two hives in the garden. And now in 2011, there are approximately 310, something like that. And that's that's what they call an infectious to... hobby. Infectious. Mm -hmm. well, what is it that appeals there? I mean, I guess you get to be outdoors and... Oh yeah, you're outdoors all the time. Or during the summer you are anyway, you know. It's... I don't know, I mean, if you... If you get a chance to look inside a hive, a working hive, you want to go in and, and have a look because it's the speed at which they work and, and how they organise, you know, it's absolutely unbelievable, really. Yeah, I guess they yeah. do most of the work for you. Well, they do all the work. I just come along and pinch the honey when they're not looking and, you know, spin it out and filter it and put it in jars and sell it. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about how a hive works then, if for someone who didn't know anything about bees, so how, how, does, how do you get honey at the other end? Right, a colony of bees lives in a hive, obviously, and it's got wooden, wooden frames in the, in the hive with a wax comb in the frame, and there are 11 of these combs in a hive, and that's where the queen lives, and at this moment in time, in July, a good healthy hive should have about between 55 and 65,000 bees in it. Um, as well as honey for themselves, pollen, which they use as the protein part of their diet to feed their babies, and honey, which they store in a series of boxes above their nest chamber, which I then remove later on when the honey flow is finished. So, because you, you've got your own hives, like how would bees uh, naturally exist? Oh, in trees, trees, yeah. hollow trees. Yeah, I suppose in caves years ago, perhaps you know. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 pretty adaptable. They're not uh, as long as it's big enough and and not sort of in waterproof. They're they can live in it, you know. But the, the bees. Uh, this is probably comes as a stupid question, but with the, the wax in the hive, that would the bees naturally produce that kind of shape or? Um, yes, they do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Only without the wooden frame. Yeah. But they always seem to be, um, and you can put bees in a cardboard box and just have a little hole for an entrance and they'll make their own combs in it. But they always seem to be sort of rounded. They don't seem to have bottom corner, I don't know why that is, but they don't seem to have the, you know, I don't know if you've seen the old sort of, the old straw skeps, like, um, oh, that, was, that one up there. Okay. That's what they used to keep bees in sort of, oh, late 1800s, something like that, you know. And there's no frames in those, they just make their own comb. Yeah. And the actual shape, like the hexagonal shape that people know from... Yeah, they, 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 they make that naturally. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like a map, they just instinctively know that there's a mathematical yeah. shape to, yeah. to the honey. Is yeah. there any reason why it is that shape? Because it's strong. And if you look at, if you, if you see a picture in a, in a magazine of a, of a piece of honeycomb, the point of the cell should always be facing upwards. Okay. But if you, if you see it in most magazines, or if you see it in adverts and things like that, where people are using a, a hexagon shape, yeah. it's always the other way around, and the bit at the top is flat. Okay. So that makes it the points at the side, which become very weak, and bees wouldn't build it like that. That's just a bit of uh, because it's, it's, for, yeah. Because it's, it's just not strong, it's going to collapse, you know? Yeah. And um. And so the the structure of uh, the hive, you said it's a colony, colony is the right A term. colony, yeah. yeah. It's a colony of bees and they live in a hive. Right, that's the name of the house. And this, um, with the colony, there's kind of, there's a structure in place, there's, there's worker bees and... Yeah, there's a, there's a queen in every hive. 
and there'd be, I said, this time of the year, anything between sort of 50 or 60 odd thousand bees. And that they should be a couple of hundred drones, which are the male bees. And you only find drones in a hive during the summer, spring in the summer. When it gets to August, they start kicking them out. They don't let them back in the hive. They won't feed them. They don't want them. Because they, it's all the, the only purpose in life is to mate with the Virgin Queen. You know, good job. Somebody's got to do it. I know, but you know. It's <laughs> yeah. And so then and there's one queen. There's, how do you tell the queen apart from the others? Oh, the queen's a lot bigger. Okay. Yeah. How much are we talking about? Oh, double the size of the ones you see flying around in your garden. Okay. They've got big, long abdomens. Yeah. You know, their bodies are in sort of three, three sections: the head, chest, with the wings on, and this long abdomen. Yeah. And so, sorry, the structure of it is that you've got the queen and what else? The workers. Yeah. And the drones. Okay, yeah, cool. But you only have the drones during the spring and the summer. And so what happens to them after that then? They get kicked out, killed off. And they just Because queen, queens don't mate during the winter. Only, they don't breed queens after, in September. Yeah. So they, they don't want drones. So they're just a draw on the resources really, you know. And and do, just do eating they, for nothing. Do they know to leave, or do they actually get? Killed? Oh no, no, they get they get physically grabbed out of and dragged out and chucked out the door. And you see that happen. Oh yeah, yeah. And what yeah. happens to them? Do they just go off? Well, they just die. Just yeah, just it's die. It's a cruel world thing. <laughs> yeah, it sounds harsh. And then so the, the honey that they're making is actually for themselves, but it's that's right. Become a bit of a. How, do you know how long it's been a delicacy for humans? Like, it's, oh no, I mean they found they found honey in the, in the pharaoh's tombs. Oh, okay. That was still sort of edible, you know. Yeah. And I should think it'd be a lot, you know, earlier than that, you know, because they must have been living in the caves and things like that when sort of prehistoric days, you know, slightly before my time, really. So I'm not, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's um, and people talk about the the medical side of honey as well. Uh, yeah. You know, do you know much about that? Or about that? Well, there's lots of research going on, on, you know, into these things, and and. Um, Honey was used during the Crimean War as an antiseptic because they didn't have antibiotics and things like that. The problem was they used honey. And when honey comes into contact with blood, it produces hydrogen peroxide. Okay. And that's what burns the wound out. Oh. And if you, if you have a, a reasonable cut on your finger, you put some honey on it, I mean, it stings like you wouldn't believe. But a couple of days, and it'll, it'll be all closed over and... Very good. It's a good start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're doing a lot of research into this manuka honey that from New Zealand that um, on ulcers and things, you know, leg ulcers and all this sort of stuff, and stomach ulcers and. Yeah, having access to the honey, do you eat a lot of honey in your diet yourself? Or? Yeah, we do. It's a bit like working in a chocolate factory, really. You get, you know, you get fed up with it after a bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and this, um, and yeah, obviously. Uh, from retiring from, uh, no, no, being made redundant from BT, sorry, I should say, being made mm. redundant. Did, at first, did that seem quite scary, or was that kind Not of a really. blessing in disguise? No, because actually, it, it'll be 16 years in July I'd have left, and they said, take this check and don't come back, you know? And I sort of, and, and it was a sort of busy time of year now, you know, so I I just got up one morning and didn't turn up for work and went in the opposite direction and worked myself, you know? Well, how were you immediately sure that you were going to take on the, the honey business? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Definitely. Had it always been a bit of a plan to kind yeah. of expand? Yeah, I mean, it got, it got to um, a huge hobby, really. You know, and it, something, something I had to give somewhere. It was either, I mean, we were bottling honey in the middle of the night and all sorts of weird things, you know, because we just didn't have enough time to sort of, you know. Yeah. And working for BT, I was finishing work at four o'clock. And five minutes later, I was back home, like, you know, so it gives you sort of two or three hours in the evening to be able to do something to, you know. So let's talk a bit about, um, I mean, where did you get your bees from originally? How did you get bees? I bought them from a man that retired in Ilminster, originally. That was the first, the first two I had. And then you just pick up swarms, and people seem to know you keep bees, you know, and they get a swarm in the garden, they ring you up, you know. And, and how do you transport bees as well? That's, that must be difficult. Uh, yeah, only in the hours of darkness, really. Oh. Why is that? Because they're not flying. They're a bit like homing pigeons, you know, they come back to their hive and they stay in there all night, so you just pop around. 
put some foam in the high in the entrance. A piece of foam rubber, you know, sponge. They shut them in, strap them up, and move walk off of them. Well, stick them in the back of the car or carry Yeah, it. yeah, Land Rover, yeah. Oh cool. And so obviously with the um the dangers of these, like the uh getting stung if you, do you get stung often um we have good days and bad days what's a bad day like um well bad day that's you know that can be ooh, 40 or 50 stings really yeah today was a good day didn't get stung at all today but you know usually you don't get stung you can go for weeks and you may only get stung once or twice you know and then perhaps one day you, you might be in a hurry or they might be a bit sort of you know cheesed off or whatever, you know, and they're no different than us really, they have off days, like, you know, and... But it's really with bees, it's kind of, um, it's a sign that, uh, of their loyalty in a way, isn't it, because they die when they, when they sting. Well, it's not really, um, it's not they call it loyalty, but it's right. a sort of, um, but they do, as you're right, they do, bees only sting once and they die. Yeah. So they don't sting sort of lightly, like, you know, they don't, um... You don't just think, oh, I'll give him a good sting in the daylight, just because, you know, it seems like a good idea, you know. <laughs> yeah. it, must be, it must be twice as annoying to get stung, because one, because of the pain, and secondly, because you've just lost one of your bees. Well, yeah, but then when there's 60 odd thousand in a hive, yeah. you know, one either way, it's not going to make much difference, is it really? Yeah. Have you, have you ever worked out how many bees you have all, all together? No, well, 310 hives, and I expect if you say there's an average of 60,000 bees at the moment, this time of the year. Quite a lot. How many is it? You've been in school since I have. <laughs> oh my god, now I can't find that out. <laughs> I'll come back to that. So, um, so yeah, in terms of getting stung, like, do, do they get everywhere? What, how, what, what techniques do you imply to not get stung? Well, we, wear, we had to wear these um, overalls all the time, you know, these white overalls. And beekeepers usually wear white overalls because it's a, a neutral colour. Because bees are a bit sort of colour sensitive, you know. Black, they hate black. Oh. You know, it's you don't wear black. You know, I got I got a couple of green boiler suits I wear. You know, and on a good day they'll tolerate them. You know, and on a bad day they really hate them. It's just just the way it is. You know, it's. So you know that bees aren't colour blind then from that. Oh no, but they have a very restricted um, colour sort of. How you call it really? Kind of, you know, spectrum like, you know? Yeah. It's, um. I suppose that makes sense if flowers are colourful and they get attracted to them. That oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Colour. Yeah. Yellow, orange, that sort of colour they really go for, like, you know? Yeah. What, what, what else can go wrong with beekeeping? What, what are the difficulties you face throughout a year? <sighs> Apart from the occasional bout of vandalism, oh. we have several sort of nasty diseases that are sort of on the equivalent of sort of foot and mouth, I suppose, in cattle and that, you know. And the, um, what is now fear are the people that used to be DEFRA, they employ inspectors that'll come around sort of during the summer and check your hives, you know. And so that must spread quite quickly then due to the Oh, it does, because all bacterial infections like, you know. And these drones, these male bees, they're accepted in any hive, whereas the worker bees only stick to the one hive. They wouldn't be allowed in to the hive next door, or the hive down the road. But the drones, they seem to be accepted in any hive. So if they come from a hive carrying this disease, then they're going to spread it to somebody else's bees. So give me an example of when, has that happened to you where you've turned up and it's... Oh yeah, I've had it two or three times, yeah. And what's yeah. that like? Well, not good, because they, they kill your bees and burn them for you, you know. Because there's no, the oh yeah, there's no, um, not the hive, but unless it's really old. Because yeah. there's no, um, there's no really to cure for it, you know. And they just kill them off with some petrol and dig a hole by the side of the hive and take all the contents of the hive out, put it in the hole, set fire to it, scrape all the hive out inside and blow torch it all. all right. and, um, and yeah, I was going to ask with the, uh, from like a vegan perspective, because uh, it's an animal pro produce, um, how, how is it, would you say it's cruel to... Uh keep bees like how, how well do you look after your bees oh very well if i don't look after them they won't produce any honey will they some that's like anything else isn't it? i mean if you don't if you don't look after a cow it doesn't produce milk yeah. you know you've got to look you've got to look after these things it's you know 
And, and when it comes to selling it and actually making the money, how, how do you, how have you worked that out? And has that had to change over the fifteen years as your hives have grown? Um, it's only changed in the fact that we we no longer look for customers; they find us. We run quite a good website, um, which has been really really good for us. Really, we so we also breed bees and sell bees to other people. And um, we've had a lot, a lot of um, business through the website. But no, and we used to go around and you, know, you just wander in a shop and have a look around and see whose honey was on the shelf, you know, and if there was no sort of Somerset honey on the shelf, you'd ask them, you know, for a jar of Somerset honey, like, you know, oh, we don't sell that. Why not? Oh, well, we, we can't get it. Oh, would you like to buy some? <laughs> So that's the kind of the marketing technique. That's it, you know. Can I say, um, what, what kind of shops do, do, does it sell in then? Oh, delicatessens, butchers, greengrocers. Um, if you're in Cheddar, all those sort of shops that, in Cheddar, you know, the, the touristy shops. Um, we do all the National Trust shops in Somerset. Um, anybody with their money, really. Have you ever ventured into sort of a bigger distribution? No, we've not quite conquered the whole of summer so yet. We're working on it, but you know, I mean, you can get. I suppose you can get too big. It's you know, it's all time, isn't it? and then you have, you know, I employ somebody to do all the bottling. I don't do the bottling. Somebody else does all that. Uh, but I'm still sort of a day and a half or two days doing the deliveries, which is still a lot this time of the year. You know, especially if it's a nice sunny day and you want to be sort of you know, and the bees are playing up. You want to be somewhere else. You know, and not. Driving around in a van delivering honey, really. Yeah, so have you just got the one employee then? Is that... Yeah, I mean, I've got one employee that does the bottling. My wife does the sort of, um, all the computer sort of side of it. And occasionally I get some help from my son and my son-in-law. Okay. If I could talk them into it. Yeah, and, um, and how, how does um, your honey compare to other commercial honey? Oh, mine's the best. Is that right? Definitely. Why is that? Well, especially being in Somerset as well, is there anything that, uh, diff like, is there a different taste or a different, does it come from different flowers or like, how does it work? No, it's just a, it's a good, just a good product. Yeah, but do you find, um, do you find that some years have been worse than other years and that that's been a side effect? Oh yeah, you don't want it to, um, I mean it was good this April, which it shouldn't have been really because it was too dry. You don't want it too dry, you know, you want it to produce honey, you want it sort of um, humid, thundery weather, you know, headachey sort of weather, where you can't sleep at night, you know, unless you've got all the windows open and sort of, you know. But then, you know, you've got good honey coming in. Definitely. Okay. And so, are you quite in tune with um, kind of what's going on then with the weather in terms of how it's going to affect business? Oh, yeah. I'm watching the weather forecast all the time. Tries to wait for the bend. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, this year's been good then? So far, we extracted just under five ton at um, the middle of May. How long does but it we need, Oh, sorry, Karen. Sorry, we needed that, this, you know, this rain we just had, we, we badly needed that, you know. Yeah. So now we just needed to get a bit sort of, the blackberries starting to come out, the clover's coming out, the lime trees are in flower. So we just need just to warm up a bit and sort of, don't want a heat wave. Just, you know, about 72 that I'll do. Oh, so how difficult do you find it um, getting away for like any sort of holiday away from your hives? Do, you, do, you have, do they uh, um, need constant maintenance? Or? It, during the summer they do really, yeah. I mean, we don't... I don't work Sundays anymore, which I used to. Um, and we have a holiday really when it's raining, you know. If it's, if it's a wet day, we go off the day and sort of, you know, in the summer. And the winter's not so bad, you know. But so rainy once, you get, once you get past the swarming bit, which is sort of, you now once you get into sort of end of July, August, the bees are not quite so, you know, they'll manage on their own, you know. In terms of the future of the company, where do you see it going next? And also, with um, your sons helping out, are they likely to come and take it? Well, they'll only help as long as I can guarantee they don't get stung. How do you guarantee that? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I tell them anything they get, I'm here to help, you know, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know. I'm going to give them all the, I can give you all the, all, all the protective gear, but I can't guarantee you won't get stung. Because yeah. I usually find that m most of the times I get stung is when I'm driving from site to site. You know, they come out your pockets and one thing or another and crawl out your arms. And... Did you build up a bit of a tolerance to it? Oh yeah, yeah. But it took me whoo, a good 20 years or more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what's the worst place you've ever been stung? Oh, you don't get stung on the eyes, on the eyelid, yeah. or around your nostrils, you know, anything like that. It's, oh. Or palm the hands is not too good either. If you pick something up and don't see the bee, and you know, and you grab hold of it, can you get stung in the palm of the hand? And cool. Is that quite often then? Well, try not to. No, but it's, <laughs> yeah. that is really painful. Are there any good um, tips and remedies to uh, deal with the bee sting? Keep away from bees, I suppose, really. <laughs> but after you have been stung? <laughs> well, I mean, there's all these old sort of wise remedies out there, like putting vinegar on it and things like that, you know. And But, you know, my, my old granny used to put these blue bags on it, you know, they, they used to use in the washing, you know. The, you're supposed to make, the, supposed to make the, like the bed sheets whiter, this stuff, and it's like um, but the size of an oxo cube bright blue and it used to come in a little cloth bag and they used to put that in with the washing you must have seen have you not seen this in the maybe you've got the museum now look around i bet they got some there and this is supposed to sort of you know all these old things are all supposed to sort of you know how do you deal with it normally then lump it just sort of scream out well you don't you know it just doesn't have any effect anymore you know yeah. no sense no feeling that's what they say isn't it yeah i suppose and it's um, and also living in Somerset. Um, have you ever lived anywhere else? Or no, no, I lived no all the time. Yeah, I lived in Yeovil for a while. And where else do you want to live? Yeah, I mean, also you must know Somerset quite well if you've got uh, your three hundred and ten hives mm -hmm. dotted around the place. Like, what what kind of an area are we talking about? We run from uh, just the side of Yeovil over to. Just to sort of Willerton and from on A38, sort of back, just this side of Cheddar and down as far as Fort Abbey and South, South Somerset on the, on the South Somerset Dorset border and all places in between, really, above the Quantock Hills. We're taken to Exmoor in a few weeks' time for the Heather. And so it's quite a big area that you have to drive around to. Yeah. Do you, do you have yeah. kind of like a, a high rotor to kind of... Oh, yeah, yeah, I try and get round of it every three weeks. Okay. But, you know, if you have three days rain, you're straight away, you're three days behind, like, you know, so... But the rain is good for the quality of the honey? Yeah, yeah. So it's all honey right. is soil moisture sucked up by plants. Soil? No. no. Soil moisture. Honey is soil, yeah. water... Sucked up by plants, sugars added through photosynthesis, mm -hmm. and collected by pollinating insects. That's all it is. And then what do the bees do to it then? The bees it? evaporate the moisture off of it because they can't store it until it's about 17 or 18 percent moisture. And they add invertase to it, the enzyme invertase, which converts the sugars. And, then, and, then and that's all they do to it. And any good beekeeper should just extract it, filter it. And put it in a glass jar. And when you say filter it, what's the process to get get out? Then how do you when you open up the hive? What do you do next? We we take all the, the boxes of um, combs back to the our yard. Cut the wax cappings off the combs. Stick them in the centrifuge. A big stainless steel centrifuge. Spin the honey out. Run it into buckets, and store it until we get orders from the shops. And we put it in these cabinets that you're leaning on there, warm it up, because it's after a few weeks it, it goes solid in the jar or in the bucket. Just warm it up and filter it through that cloth in the corner there. What would you have to filter out honey? Other bits of bees? And... Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> wasps, bits of wax, bits of pollen, bees legs, bees wings. It's a fact of life, you know, you, dead bees. Yeah, and also you mentioned that um, you get the clear and the uh, like. You get the runny clear stuff, and then the, yeah, like this the is the, this is the runny. 
the runny what, stuff. What's the difference between the two? That's what it looks like when it's extracted. And after a few weeks, it goes like that. Solid. Is there a difference in kind of like the... That's exactly the same sort of honey. Just different consistency. All, all honey given time goes from that to that. Depending on the makeup of the sugars that are in the original nectar. The more glucose there is, the faster it sets, the finer the grain, because it's crystals, right? And the smoother the texture. So things like oilseed rape, clover, contain a lot of glucose, set like concrete, but it's got this nice smooth texture. Okay. Is, it, is there just the two kinds of honey or is there... Oh no, I mean, there's what? Well, I mean, all different varieties of honey if you have it tested to see where it's come from. You know, you can send it away to, um, sorry, but that is ivy honey. Okay. Like ivy that grows on the wall, you know? Yeah. 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 Got a good sense of smell? Okay. Oh wow, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah, it tastes like that. Oh, right. How, how do you stop the bees from collecting from other areas? Do you have to kind of force them into Well, I mean, they, they, yeah. I mean, with a heather, we, we, we take them to Exmoor, so we know the, the honey is heather honey, because there's not much else on Exmoor at that time of the you know, time of the year. Same with the ivy, really. It, by the time it gets to sort of ivy flowering time, end of September, there's not a lot else around. You know, it's... Um, and that you could sell as a sort of... You could put the word ivy on the label. Right, because you know it's more than 66% ivy. Oh, is there certain legalities? It's got to be, oh yeah, it's got to be 60, it's got to be 66% or more of what you say it is. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just in terms of the tools you use, what, what, what kind of, uh, do you have to have in your arsenal as a beekeeper? We use a, a, a long thing that looks like, a, looks like a chisel, metal chisel, that's called a hive tool, um, which is used to prise the boxes apart. And it's, it, most of them have a sort of a J on the end, and you, you put it down between the, the combs and prise them out, you know, before you can lift them out. And a smoker. That's all you need. And the smoker um, is what puts the bees... Does it put them to sleep, or just... No, it's... Um, it, it's supposed to personate um, forest fires. You know, back in the in the dark ages when they all lived in trees, if there was a, if there was a forest fire, they'd stuff their cells full of honey, just in case their home got burnt down and they weren't able to sort of you know get any more food for a while. It's like you on your Sunday lunch. You see, once you've had stuffed yourself full of full of your mother's Sunday lunch, you're you know you're quite happy, aren't you? And sort of you know. That's just about keeping the bees happy. That's right. So. Yeah, yeah. Keep them content. Yeah. And also you mentioned about, because um, obviously with the maintenance and they're all over the place, you mentioned about vandalism. Does that happen oh, to yeah. you then? It does happen, yeah. Who, who, like, what do they do? That seems a bit weird to me. To... <sighs> well, it's mostly sort of, you know, kids with nothing to do, really. What do they do? Sort of, they you know, smash up the... 19, 20 year olds, something like that, you know, with curly hair and that, you know, they're all sort of... No, I mean, it's, I mean, the last time we had it was, was on the edge of Taunton, you know, I mean, this chat was a real, I don't know how you describe it, really, a bit odd, you know, I mean, we had these bees in a derelict farmyard, and he just came in and set fire to them, you know. Really? Mm. Along with his own house lot, you know, so. Oh, right. <laughs> then we've had bees next to a sort of, um, a, a school in Taunton. Uh, well, well, a, a public school in Taunton that sort of remained nameless, but um, they got really vandalised. The kids chucking bits of school pottery at them and sort of, you know, bricks and concrete blocks. And I mean, a lot, a lot of people must not like bees because they only know them because they, they've been stung by them. Well, it's this, you know, it's this sort of cartoon image, isn't it, really, of a, of a swarm of bees in a tree, you know? And kids throwing sticks at it or poking it with a stick, you know, and then, you know, the bees chasing them, you know, I think it's that sort of, 
Oh, they're hoping to get attacked. <laughs> Trevor did not get attacked often enough, really, you know. But, um, but you know, it's a fact of life that happens, no matter what you, you know. It, it's, um, in terms of, like, the legalities of it, like you were saying with the Ivies, there are also legalities of um, uh, ownership of bees. Like, if someone was to take your bees, if you could prove it was theirs, and do you get bee thieves? And Oh, yeah, you become stolen. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Now, I, went, I once went to a talk many years ago and this chap said the only thing you need to start beekeeping is a wheelbarrow and a dark night. Hey. Right? Yeah. Now how often does that happen? Have you had it happen to you quite a few times? A couple of times I have, yeah. Yeah, not recently, but you know, it's Yeah, so it gives you a weird feeling when you turn up and find out your hives missing, you know? Yeah. It's a bit like going outside and finding somebody's pinched your New motorbike or something like that, you know. Or, do, yeah. do you ever have your suspicions of other beekeepers doing it? Or? Uh, not really, it's funny, no. You never do what I said, I've got to prove it. I mean, all my hives are branded and sort of, you know, I've got big numbers painted on the roofs and things like that. But, um, oh, the actual whole hive is gone rather than the. Oh, yeah, oh, it's yeah. Not just the bees. Oh, no, 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 you can't just take the bees, you've got to yeah. take the whole hive, haven't you? You've got to, you know. Is missing, yeah. Mm. Cool. I was uh, kind of as my, my final few questions is uh, what, what is it that you think you like about living in Somerset and uh, and in terms of being a beekeeper? Oh, well, we get good weather most of the time, you know. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, I mean, I as far as I'm concerned, I, I need the rain as much as I need the sunshine, you know. So, I mean. Yeah, so that's a good place to live, isn't it? Where else you want to live? Could you imagine living in a city and being a beekeeper? Oh, no, but there are. No, 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 not really, no. But there's some a big beekeeping association in the middle of London. Oh. Keep hives on all the roofs and things like that, you know. And yeah, it's... I don't know, I just like, like being out and about, really, you know. So in the, in the long-term uh, kind of future of the business... Do you see it kind of being like a family trade, or do you reckon your your son will get um, more into it? If I would, I would, I would like to think so, but I don't think it's going to happen, really. You know, that's um, so the, what will happen to Sedgemore? Also, why is it called Sedgemore Honey if it's uh, if you're not in Sedgemore? Well, because my yard is in Sedgemore. Oh, the majority of your bees. Yeah, so. yeah, they're all around the sort of edge of Sedgemore, you know. And, yeah. Do you get a beekeeper apprentice roles that people want to come and help? I, I quite often get people phone up and want to come and help, you know. But there's help and there's help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it's... Uh, and I'm usually sort of... I can be quite a long way from here, like, you know, a long way away, you know. And if you're the wrong sort of person and you get stung, and, you know, you're going to want me to take you to hospital, aren't you, really, sort of, you know. Be perfectly before you die, like you know. Well, that's interesting. You say the wrong kind of person. Just as my final question, um, what what kind of personality and uh, characteristics do you think you need to be a good beekeeper? Um, a bit laid back, that's for certain. But it's not about that. It's whether you're when I, when I said about the wrong person, I'm talking about stinging, really. You know, I mean, they don't. So it's taken me twenty years, and I have no effect on me at all. But it could be that you're the person that gets stung and passes out, or even even dies. I mean, it happens. You know, that's why that's why I consider to be the wrong, the wrong sort of person. But what with the rest of the job and also being like a freelancer in this kind of environment, is is there any certain personality traits you think you need to have to do it well? <sighs> yeah, you you got to be capable of working for yourself. You got to have the, the drive. You know, it's not a good sort of. Um, working for yourself and not being able to get up in the morning, you know. And especially with the beekeeping, because I usually shift them first thing, you know, very early in the morning, like, you know, half past three, four o'clock in the morning. Just as it's, when it's just light enough to see what I'm doing, but not light enough for them to start flying around. And if you're sort of half an hour late, you could be too late, because by the time you get there, the bees are flying, and whatever you're going to do is cancelled until the next morning. But you, so you still enjoy the job then? Oh yeah, yeah. Still good like thing getting up early in the morning. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, 
I've got no intentions of retiring, you know. 